You're listening to NFT 365, the first daily podcast on NFTs with your host, Fanzo. What's up, friends? Welcome back to another episode of NFT 365. And I have a question for you. You know, one of the things that, you know, I've been, you know, I've been a community builder, community advocate, uh, keynote speaker on communities, the power of communities. You know, I've written multiple chapters on the fact that I believe the future of business is community. Now, with that being said, here's the question I have for you, the listeners. If you had to think about, you know, community as a whole, what do you believe are the driving factors that make community building in Web3 more complex or more difficult? Or maybe, do you believe that? Maybe that's even the question. Do you believe building community in a Web3 environment is more complex than offline or more complex than Web2? And I'm going to let you kind of think about on that for a minute. And I'm just going to factor in some things that I, that I hope you can, uh, you know, kind of listen to, kind of think about. Because, you know, with a lot of community, you know, when we think about community as a whole, one of the things we, we have to recognize is that there is about, you know, being inclusive while also being exclusive, right? The idea that a community requires this, like, there, there needs to be an entry point, right? There, there needs to be a velvet rope. Uh, there needs to be, like, an onboarding. Now, I've said for a long time that I believe most communities actually fail because they, they, st- they, they believe or they rely too heavily on just the leaders, the founders, the earliest adopters of being the ambassadors, the onboarders, and the culture setters of, of community. I think one of the things that we'll, we'll often see is that people will feel, you know, early on, they feel very welcomed in the community. And then eventually, as the community grows, they, the new people don't feel as welcomed. And the people that were there early on don't feel as though that, you know, they feel like they should be entitled to more or less. You know, there's like a, a complexity there. And I will also say, you know, we've said a lot on this podcast on, you know, is, you know, what is community really? Because we have people that, you know, just because you have a discord does not mean you have a community, right? Just because you have an email newsletter does not mean you have a community, right? You can have an audience, you can have followers, you could have listeners, you could have subscribers, you could have, you know, a network of people, right? Like I think like to me, that's actually one of the, the soap boxes that I talk about, right? There's a difference between a network and a community, right? A network are people that are joined together because of the people that are involved, right? So your network, much like your Facebook, is a network, right? People have to, you have to be friends with someone on Facebook before you to get access to them. That is different than a community, right? A community comes together because of those shared, that shared purpose and a common passion for outcomes. Now, those outcomes, that's actually a big piece of this, right? Like when you think about, you know, um, a, a community, we have to all have very similar or aligned uh, passions for these outcomes. And what I mean by outcomes in this sense is that we have to all kind of be understanding that this is a, like our definition of success, and this is how we measure that in alignment to the purpose of this community, right? A community without any purpose or culture is not a community, right? It's just a group of people. And we've all been, you know, part of, of many different groups of people and, you know, uh, places that, you know, were either advertised as a community. And, and I would say like, you know, the, the interesting, you know, crossover here is that I actually think the, the association world, right? If you, if you're a listener right now and you're, a member of an association. I'm a member of the National Speakers Association. It's actually the only association, uh, I think it's actually the only association I've ever uh, been a member of. Uh, I, I was in a fraternity, Kappa Delta Rho, shout out to KDR, Radford University, Tau Alpha Chapter. Uh, I was the consul there um, back in 2001. Um, but, you know, um, from an association perspective where I'm paying dues into um, it only the national speakers association is really the only one that I've ever joined. Now it's not because I don't believe in associations. It's not because I don't understand in the value of networking and the people, but 
it's so interesting because I, I remember going into college and believing that like, I'm never going to join a fraternity. Why would I want to buy my friends? Like, I'm not like a, you know, cool frat boy. Like, I didn't, like, what the heck? Like, that was like, that's the dumbest idea ever. But then I recognize the importance of like of what a fraternity stands for, right? And even like the whole pledging process, right? The reason you have to pledge a fraternity is that because it allows everyone to go through the same uh, process to prove, to validate, and to really um, demonstrate your commitment to being a part of it. And it also allows, you know, for, for culture and, and community to be kind of grown through it. It also allows you to kind of gate who, you know, you can almost force out people that are going to be toxic or bad, um, for your fraternity by pledging. Funny enough for me, associations for the most part, that the, there really isn't a pledge process. Oftentimes there's an application process but let's face it, a lot of times that just requires us to, you know, meet a bunch of check marks. Like you have to have done this, this and this, have, you know, been in business this long. You have to have, you know, two people recommend you. But for me, like the interesting part of all of this, and it goes back to that question I asked, is that I actually think community building in Web3 is extremely complex because I want us to factor in a couple aspects and I'll, I'll tie them into kind of what I just shared there. Right. The idea that, you know, when as it's being built, right, we want to we want to feel and have a sense of community before people are owners within the community as NFT owners. Right. So as founders, you have to really shape and shepherd and and be involved in kind of growing this initial community. Well, then when you launch an NFT project. You now have people that are coming in as owners. Some of them might have been in before, but some of them might come in not until the day that they actually are buying the NFT. I mean, for me, I, just because I'm in so many discords, I'm often not getting into a discord until a week or so uh, before the project launches. Well, so in that community, right out of, out of the jump, like on Mint Day, you have the people that are, are been there early and maybe they didn't win the raffle. Maybe they didn't have enough liquidity. And so some people that were in early a part of the community they don't have the NFT ownership, but they've been there uh, uh, in, you know, on the journey this whole way being you know, part of that community. So now if you think about it inside of those walls, you have the founders that kind of created it, the started, those that were those early adopters, like the, the alpha testers, the beta testers. And then you have the owners of those NFTs that come in and now you have 10,000, you know, maybe probably not 10,000 because not, you know, a lot of people will buy more than one of the NFTs. So let's say like 6,000 new members. Well, this also adds a complexity because what does ownership mean within a community? This is actually a great question, right? Because one of the complexities of a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization, is that if you, if everyone has equal votes or equal rights to their share of ownership on voice or voting for what things are going to happen within a DAO, I will tell you, I, I was, I've been a member of a DAO that didn't have a very um, dialed in process around the, the voting, around, you know, the weighted of like who gets the vote, how many votes count. And it was, it was a bunch of creators. And guess what? We got nothing done for many months because we could not agree on anything. And the, the poor founders and creators of this DAO were, you know, had their mission, but they also wanted to give up some of that control, some of that, you know, that, that need that they, uh, you know, kind of had to, you know, shape. They wanted to let everyone else kind of have a voice, make sure everybody's voice is heard. And I think it's actually interesting because I was having this discussion with a friend you know, as we're building out the strategy for our next, uh, you know, our big NFT drop that we're going to have here uh, around the podcast. And, you know, the, the, the comment came up and said, you know, there's a difference between creating a community and creating a community that is a democracy, right? And it's such an interesting component in Web3. If we think about it, once the founders, once the NFTs are minted out, the founders must take less of a role or lesser of a role because now you have all of these additional owners. But the founders are also the ones that were initially shaping the, the culture, the purpose, and the passion for the outcome. So the question starts to, 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 to kind of fester within an NFT project is that how committed or how stuck in, the, in their ways are the founders to doing the way, things the way that they wanted 
versus listening to their community and kind of coming to a, a, an agreement of maybe adjusting things as you move forward or kind of becoming losing so much of the purpose and the passion because the community, the, what the community wants, the people that you actually attract into your NFT project aren't actually aligned with your purpose. I would actually argue that has been a big problem over the last nine months. A lot of times the utility and the purpose of an NFT project, the people that are the initial owners of the NFT do not match that purpose and that passion. What do you mean? What do I mean by that? There's a lot of people that are just in NFTs to make a quick buck. Or there are a lot of people that are in NFTs to come in, you know, stick there for about, you know, a couple of weeks and then jump out and make money, right? Or to flip in, flip out, or always be, you know, really only focusing on the floor price. And if people only care about the floor price, if that's their only um, objective, uh, objection or uh, objective, then the, your delivery on utility only matters to them if it makes the floor price go up or, or become stable, well, do you want people in your community that don't really care about the value being provided? Rather, they care about how that value matches the bottom line. And last time I checked, when, when we join communities, for the most part, I, I think about my fraternity, I think about the National Speakers Association, you can think about your, your local church, or, you know, whatever, you, whatever you believe in, whatever your, you know, your faith is. Uh, maybe you could think of you know, a, a group of moms um, that, that are, are joining together. Or maybe it's like the, uh, the business marketing uh, association or a startup club that you're a part of. If you think about it, there isn't, there isn't another scenario where there is really no pledging or no kind of like uh, validating of the people that are coming in to an NFT project community that they are aligned exactly with the purpose. And so for a lot of projects, I believe they got lost. They lost themselves. And this is why I think it's so complex because here's the other part of this, right? As the project goes on, you have the people that minted the NFTs that are excited because they've been there since the jump. And that's me in most, almost all the projects that I hold. I, I'm very proud that I minted them, right? Like I believed in them from the start. But here's the problem in the NFT space. Well, we have a secondary market for a reason, right? And it's important to have secondary volume of trade, people moving in and out. But as the community starts to form, right, people drop off that don't care about the utility, people join um, and then realize they don't have the, the time commitment, whatever that may be. One of the things that, that starts to happen is there, there's like this sense of like, okay, we, we are all in this together, right? We can wag me, right? It's the wag me group. Well, all of a sudden, the next utility is going to drop. And now there is a bunch of new people that are buying into the project for the first time on secondary. And they're probably jumping in and saying, hey, brand new person, didn't know about this project until the other day, but I just minted one. You know, what's going on? Well, part of the, 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 the complexity that this adds to the community is think about the amount of different people that we now have to, to um, satisfy, that we need to recognize, that we need to empower. The early adopters that maybe never bought our NFT but have been active in our community. Those that minted the NFT and felt like, hey, we believe from the beginning. Maybe those that have been passive in the community but waiting for the first utility. And then those that are coming in on the secondary market because they see that immediate value. Well, now the, the, the culture, the people and the, the process and the, the um, passion for outcome, well, now it adds, now it's pretty complex, right? Like now it's really dynamic. And then we add on top of that things like tokenomics, where we are now giving coins and we are uh, allowing additional entry points. Like if you look at Board Ape Yacht Club, right? Board Ape Yacht Club started with one project that was kind of mocking that they were bored in crypto, right? And I remember being in that, in that clubhouse room. Right? And then they had the serum and they had the, the mutants. And then, they, of course, they had the kennel club. Right? So then they have the dogs. Well, they, they went from a, a small community to, with the mutants, a larger community, to the, the kennel club, an even larger community. And I will tell you, when I was in NFT NYC, one of the things that like, really disgusted me was that people that were Bored Ape Yacht Club holders were like shaming and shunning those that were mutant ape uh, holders. But if you think about it, there is like that, that thing like, hey, we bought in originally. Now, here's the funny thing about that is some of the people that were shaming mutant ape 
uh, holders were in the community far less than anyone else because they just came in and bought Board Ape Yacht Club once it was successful. And then they were shaming people that might have been in the community since before it even launched. They just didn't have the liquidity or understanding of the project at the start. And then they jumped in a little bit later when they were able to, to buy a mutant on, on secondary market or kennel club later on. Well, then, of course, as that kind of expands, now you have, you have like little subsections within your communities. And I, and I think, you know, I, we, I think we're referring to them as factions here in the NFT space where, you know, like in the lazy lions, they have the, the lazy hats. So any of the ones that have lazy on the hat, there's like a, a, a separate faction of them, right? On the, in the Bunny Buddies uh, project, a project that I like a lot, you know, they have the, the gold, the gold uh, you know, bunnies, they have the glitter bunnies, and those are like factions within the different uh, projects. But those are are ultimately community driven. If you think about, you know, Board Ape Yacht Club, Mutants, and the Kennel Club, those are founder driven initiatives, right? Where you're expanding the community versus just adding layers within, right? So think of it this way. 10,000 uh, you know, members of a community that has factions, those people that are a part of the community are, are kind of you know, joining different groups, aligning themselves with different people within the 10,000. But with Mutant Ape, they added more people to the, the group, and, but really there's two, almost two different you know, groups that are coming together. And then, of course, you have Kennel Club. Well, then it comes down the road where they're going to add ApeCoin. And now ApeCoin is an entry point. Like if I'm holding, you know, a million dollars in ApeCoin, do I, am, am I entitled to just as much of a community say as someone that owns a board Ape Yacht Club? I mean, I have more money invested, right? But if I only came in from an ApeCoin, what is that? How does that all stand out, right? And then they add the metaverse and the other side. And we all saw what happened there because all of us that were like, wait a second, we missed out on this. We missed out on this. And, and board Ape Yacht Club is the gold standard, the pillar in our space. Well, I better not miss out on this. Well, here's the problem with each of that. Scaling a community is the hardest without even question, right? I think building a community, growing a community, nurturing your community, all of them are complex and all of them can be difficult depending on you know, a variety of different things. But I actually think scaling a community in a way that it doesn't lose its culture, its purpose, but it's, will, but it's also open to adapting, right? I actually think like this is the, this is that magic sauce is that the community and the founders have to be committed enough to stay true to their purpose that they believed in, but also adapt as the community grows, as, as the, the needs and the desires of the community are also kind of putting it out there. And this can be really, really hard. And I will tell you the other part of this that we didn't even mention yet is think about the onboarding, Right. If all of a sudden you're joining a community as a other side metaverse land holder, how do how are you welcomed into the community with the board ape yacht club, the mutant apes, the kennel club and the ape coin holders? Right. Like, are you less than are you equal? But then also, how do you keep the, the original board ape yacht club minters, those that minted first? How do you keep them happy? Well, in a way. The ape coin is what was was used there, right? The tokenomics of the ape coin, you know, a couple of friends of mine that have multiple board apes, they had not taken any liquidity out of the project, right? They've minted the board apes, they've had them the whole time. So they were able to take like half of their ape coin supply and cash that out. So now they're, they're getting kind of like paid or they're able to get rewarded for owning that board ape yacht club because people forget that, right? Just because you mint, let's say you minted two board ape yacht clubs, you're not you're not sitting with millions of dollars if you haven't, you know, sold any or flipped any or, or put um, either one of those up for sale. You just have two assets that are worth that amount. And so I will, I, will, I will conclude by saying this. On top of all of that, you have the desire to get people to hold their NFTs. So you have to provide community value and utility to get people to hold. But you also need to market and advertise outside so that people want, you know, so that increases the demand, right? So this is like that weird, like in a weird way, like I feel like I need to go on my yellow board here behind me, right? You have a, you have a supply, a demand, but then you have an attention, you have a holder culture, you have early adopters rewarding your super fans, but then you also have to onboard new people. And then you also have to understand what is your, what is your growth? What is your, you know, other aspects? I said this from the beginning, when I heard Bird Ape, Board Ape Yacht Club teamed up with Adidas. I was like, wow, Adidas is okay with like 40,000 people being the only people that would buy their merchandise? I mean, because I don't know about you. I don't own a Board Ape Yacht Club or a Mutant. 
or a kennel club, I'm not buying a Board Ape Yacht Club merchandise. Zero percent chance I'm owning any of that. And so, of course, then you have to find new entry points. And we're seeing this with a lot of projects. You know, crypto dads launched crypto moms. And that was a whole another complexity because crypto moms, in my opinion, the art is better than the crypto dads, but never really took on like it took off like it should have, right? You have other projects. I mean, there's, I mean, uh, Chibi Apes. We have the Chibi Apes. We have Chibi Galaxy, right? Then, we, then I'm right now, I'm in Psychedelics Anonymous, my current, you know, favorite project. And we had, you know, there's, uh, a new NF, a uh, new PFP uh, called the DE that's coming out very soon. Um, I just burnt today three of my components to get a a, a new uh, NFT that is supposed to be you know kind of like one of the key components to the 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 whole uh, you know the whole process the whole game. So I'm going to finish by saying this. Without question, my answer to that question I asked my, without hesitation, my answer to the question that I asked at the beginning. Is building a Web3 community more complex and more difficult than Web2 and offline? Hell freaking yes. But I don't believe it's impossible. And I actually believe if it's done well, where you empower community managers, you educate founders, you empower your audience, your community to realize that it's up to all of us to onboard. Like if you are in our Discord right now, if I was the only person welcoming you into the community in our Discord for this podcast, the, the community would fail because it, would, it does not scale and, it's, and then it's a one-to-many um, kind of relationship. But if you believe in we are greater than me, I believe the missing component to digital community was that ownership, that pledging component. And how funny is it that I didn't think about this before I started this episode. I had some notes here. But I actually think, what could we do to add a pledging of a fraternity or sorority component to NFT communities. I've said this for a long time. I don't believe there's enough um, celebration or, uh, or, uh, or rewarding of those that are holding on to their mint NFT, right? Like I minted Crypto Dads. I minted uh, Crypto Chicks. I minted Psychedelics Anonymous. I minted well, after mine got stolen with Psychedel Anonymous, right? I minted in-betweeners. I minted uh, Superstitious, uh, the Secret uh, Superlative Society. I minted Bubblegum Kids. I, and, I, and I say all that because like, for me, because I believed and I've never sold, I actually think there's, there's value in rewarding those that have done that. But then that also does that alienate those that are on the secondary market, right? It's like when, uh, I mean, we see the, t- the, the cell phone commercials, right? Like uh, it used to be like, oh, new, new cell phone, people that sign up for AT&T uh, right now are going to get a free phone. But if you've been with us for five years, you have to pay $1,000 for a new phone. Well, that doesn't work. But if it's the other way, that also doesn't really work, right? Only people that have been with us for five years get this discount. And everyone that's brand new, you have to pay a premium. Well, how does that work from like onboarding and bringing people in the community? I will say in the weirdest way, this component of training community managers, understanding the difference between community manager and a discord moderator, right? Understanding how to, to teach founders and, and help founders shape their mission, but also allow the owners of the NFTs to grow. And then to also kind of how do you adapt? How do you add? And I, I will say the, 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 the answer to me in making this all work is one word, is one word is the answer to making this all work in Web3. And I really do believe in the, the craziest way, like we can come back to this episode. I believe Web3 communities will change the world. I believe they are the greatest that are out there. But they are the most complex aspects of community that we've ever see, seen before. And that one word, my friends, that I believe is the secret to making communities really thrive in Web3, transparency. Transparency. Because how do you create collaboration? Transparency. How do you create community uh, empowerment? Transparency. How How do you allow people to feel like their voice is heard but not have to listen to everyone? Remember what I said there? People want to know that their voice is heard. It doesn't mean that you have to listen to everyone's advice. That's a big delineation. Most people get that wrong. Transparency is the answer. How do you continue to adapt and grow? Transparency. 
I'm going to talk more about this in future episodes, but I thought this was a fun one to put out there. As always, my friends, thank you so much for listening to NFT 365. Please subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening to it. Hit follow if you're on Spotify. Hit subscribe on Apple or on on Google. Um, and if you are looking for like a new way to listen to your podcast, stay tuned. I have a, a cool um, app that we're collaborating with that we're going to actually um, really hopefully redefine what podcast listenership is in Web3 using an app that's really built perfectly for Web3. But that's not for another uh, a little bit. But until tomorrow, my friends, make a great day. Cheers. Cheers.